Artists, however, have looked to Pollock ever since as a kind of talisman. He was immensely influential. He broke the ice, said Willem de Kooning. He created a new scale for American painting, a fresh idea of surface and touch, a new kind of space. But if you ask where the deeper appeal of his work lies, part of the answer has to be its American romanticism, its sense of the presence of an epic landscape, the memory of links between man and nature in the new world that had infused American art a hundred years before. Abstract expressionism had its theological side a yearning for transcendent experience that would go beyond the things of this world. Mark Rothko was obsessed with the idea of an abstract art that would carry the full weight of religious meaning. In the 40s, he had looked for what he called tragic and timeless subject matter. Now the subject was gone, and the format was that of landscape hovering oblongs of colour, moody blurs stacked vertically up the canvas. It's the silence and pervasive light of 19th century luminism on a much bigger scale. Rothko had an exquisite sense of colour and of formal nuance, especially along the edges of his shapes. But the hope that this or any other abstract art could carry the tragic weight of King Lear or the moral elevation of the Old Testament was bound to fail, though many people thought he had succeeded, an idea that got hoisted into myth by Rothko's suicide in 1970. The belief in sublime awe that inflated so much writing about abstract expressionism was part of a period style. The feeling that artists and the critics who backed them were locked in a high stakes struggle with the whole history of past art. Did everything the abstract expressionists painted live up to the rhetoric about it? Well, of course not. Nothing could. Big claims were made for these artists, and one or two of them, like Clifford Still or Barnett Newman, made them for themselves. These are Barnett Newman's Stations of the Cross, which now have their own room in the National Gallery of Washington. As documents of early minimalism, they're not without interest, but as a narrative of the passion and suffering of Jesus Christ, they're utterly absurd. Newman once said, I thought our quarrel was with Michelangelo. Well, bad luck, Barney, you're lost. Just as Pollock renewed American painting, so David Smith in the 1950s reinvented American sculpture. True to his name, he worked mainly with welded iron. But like Pollock, his work played off landscape, whether as a background, as here, or as an image in the work. As stuff to make sculpture out of, iron didn't have a long history like marble or bronze. It was industrial, it spoke of the machine age, its direct power, its structure, balance, mobility and variety. All of that was in Smith's work. Oh David, said Bob Motherwell, his friend, grieving after Smith's death in 1965, you were as delicate as Vivaldi and as strong as a Mack truck. And so he was. The idea of welding steel into sculpture came from two Spaniards, Julio González and Pablo Picasso. Smith loved the directness of welding, which rivaled the directness of painting. He was a user-up of discarded things, a collagist in three dimensions. 
His work was an inspired fusion of the formal elements of Cubism with the imagery of Surrealism. Even cast-off tools went into the work for their own sake as form and as a tribute to the act of making. Smith grew up with American industry. As a child, he had played around factories and railroad yards. Big American metal was nature to him. He wanted all his work to be at human scale. It's seldom bigger than a body, and sometimes it looks like one, a personage, a totem. If Smith often evoked the body, Willem de Kooning couldn't leave it alone. It pervaded his work. A tangled, dirty cream image of what? Bodies is the short answer, but not whole ones. Forms slipping and jostling against one another, the line creating memories of limbs, butts, elbows, and every inch full of energy. This painting is arguably the best one of his career. There's even what appears to be a set of floating teeth, the dentures that his women would soon be sporting. I just wanted to make it easy for myself to put something right in the center of the canvas. Like it had two eyes and nose and mouth and arms and feet. I uh, had a lot of mouth cuts out of magazines. And I noticed that when I had something, a photographic image like this, the mouth, it gave me a point of reference, uh, was something to hold on to. I pasted it on and it, it was a shock. Then I knew where I had to go. And then, of course, a woman's mouth is very appealing. It is interesting, though, that I could only do it with a woman. I guess it's because I'm not a woman. De Kooning's work had a way of annoying the critics who wanted it to be more abstract than it was. The ghosts of Baroque figure painting kept jogging his elbow. He was, after all, a Dutchman, an illegal alien who jumped ship into America in 1926 from the same country as Rubens and Franz Howells, where he'd been thoroughly trained in figure drawing. Hence, the women he continued to paint from the 1950s on. The eyes of woman one glare at you like a pair of black headlamps. She has the worst overbite in all Western art. She's imposing and commonplace and full of a power which flows from the slashing brush strokes into her body. De Kooning called himself a slipping glimpser, open to a constant stream of impressions, visual slang and high art, pin-up girls, but Manet too. High and low, everywhere. And how couldn't you love what highbrows called the low? The great symbol of America's new post-war life was that emblem of passion, freedom and innovation, the automobile. They're all image, packed with the symbolism of sex and power. 
They have the tails of rockets and chromium breasts like Jane Mansfield. And when you hit the brakes, the rear end lights up like a robot animal in heat. Ultramatic ride, Dynaflow penetration, triumph, lust, aggression, and tons of room for the whole family. The siren song of Imperial America. The parade of new cars starts across the stage among the dancing motorettes. Car commercials of the 50s are fascinating because they're constantly showing a car on a pedestal as though it were a David Smith at an art exhibition, only the difference would be that the camera would then rotate around the car so that you could see all these insanely wonderful angles. Um, this is as spiky as any abstract expressionist composition. I'm sure that's what tail fins are all about. <laughs> 